This is a school board workshop for the Cape Elizabeth School Board to discuss the options recommended by the School Space Study Committee. Before I turn the meeting over to Dr. Goldman, who will give us an overview, I have a few statements to make. The timeline for the school board is as follows. Tonight's workshop, as I said, is to discuss all options. At our regular school board meeting on Tuesday, December 10th, we will set aside time for public input. At our January school board meeting on Tuesday, January 14th, we will again set aside time for public input. On Tuesday, January 21st, we will have our final meeting and after hearing more public input, we'll then have a special meeting to vote on an option. No one option has been decided upon by the board up to this point, nor will the board reach a decision tonight. The board needs to consider input from many sources, including school faculty and staff, citizens with children at all different levels in our system, citizens without children in our system, town council, the professional architects involved, and the list goes on. We need to consider educational philosophy, cost, population projections, and many other factors before we can vote on any one choice. This decision is so important and long range that it goes beyond any one special interest priority. And we will try to do our best what is right for the entire system K through 12. At the meeting tonight, we will hear first from Dr. Goldman, then the board will discuss the options and ask questions. Then I will invite the public to speak. Please bear in mind that the main purpose of this meeting is for the board to discuss the options. Each person from the public will have two minutes to speak, and I hope to end the meeting by about 10 p.m. Thank you. I'll turn the meeting now over to Dr. Goldman. Thank you. I'm going to use the overhead, um, and I do have some copies of what the overheads are about, but they're not terribly um, factual. If anybody has uh, to put the bill on, I don't think you need to take, turn all the lights off because I'll be going through this rather slowly uh, and using it more as a way to anchor you in some issues. I'm not sure. I see we have a number of people here. I understand from the phone calls we had during the day that some of you received uh, a flyer. I really don't know where it came from. Unfortunately, it wasn't signed, so I wasn't able to call anybody to correct some of the misimpressions I think that were on that flyer. But at the same time, I'm glad to see you and I uh, compliment you for coming out on a night like this. We thought hard about whether we should have the meeting, but um, as uh, Jan Solon has just explained, this is an issue that has a timeline that we have to move on and uh, we're getting into a busy and wintry time of year, so we thought we had better stay with our timeline. Um, again, I am not sure how many of you are aware, and since we had a number of phone calls that made it clear that many people are not aware of what has been going on on the Space Study Committee, I thought I'd take a few minutes before I actually get into some of the specifics to explain process. About a year ago, as a matter of fact, uh, Jeff White, who is now seated beside Rosemary Reed, I uh, was appointed chair of a committee called the School Space Study Committee. It was uh, essentially most of the uh, members were appointed uh, from the town by the town council. There was also school board representation, and I also met with the uh, committee. It has met, I think, a total, Jeff, of 34 times, if I remember your town. So. It's 
I think more, more than 25. Um, and presented its culminating report to both the council and town, uh, the town council and the school board on the 29th of last month. So just actually, uh, we have had the full report now for about a month. We did give updates constantly, both at the school board meeting and in various other ways, for people who were involved with the schools, interested, or had some idea that these studies were going on. Um, there has been notice given in the Portland Press Herald. The Cape Courier had a lead uh, article on school space needs um, the last time it came out, and uh, with a statement, I believe, that it was going to be an expensive uh, deal for us to deal with some of our problems. And at the same time, it mentioned the report, and it said that there were four options out of um, actually nine that had been recommended for further study. In the months since that report was put together or given its final um, form, we also administratively and in groups at the school level have talked about what these options are. I recognize, as I've said many times in talking about this, that this feels very much like the old uh, nursery school puzzle of somebody trying to cross a river with a fox, a chicken, and a bag of, of grain. Uh, and not being able to take more than two items at once. So that uh, one really is in the middle of a multifaceted dilemma when you look at the school problems in Cape Elizabeth. We have three major buildings. They are actually composed of a number of pieces, particularly at the elementary level. And we also have, we have at the same time a space problem and we have a critical renovation problem. The two elementary buildings, particularly the middle school, but also, unfortunately, Pond Cove School, are riddled with a variety of issues. Um, they need renovation. They need special program spaces in some cases. But I'm also concerned about life code, uh, bringing the buildings really up to code structurally, electrically, as far as heat is concerned, as far as air quality control. We're doing testing for mold and spore kinds of issues. Uh, we have uh, old carpeting that we're having to tear out and throw away. Uh, we have numerous building renovation problems. That is a whole set of issues, and I showed about a 20-minute slideshow a month ago when we went through this, and I know it was on cable TV a number of times. Again, I don't know how many people in the audience happened to catch that. Uh, I'd be very happy to show that again, but I think it's kind of time consuming and tonight we're really focusing on options. Um, but that there is um, plenty of visual proof and we'd be happy to give guided tours if anybody wants to see it. The options we're going to be talking in, uh, about tonight, and I'm going to go through each one briefly, and if it's the first time you've heard of them all, uh, you may well have difficulty following the details, but we'll be happy to answer questions. Uh, what the board is faced with right now is making an extremely difficult choice and one of the choices may be that they cannot make a choice because all of what we're talking about is expensive and everything that we're talking about adds up to uh, a multi-million dollar problem and uh, admittedly this is a tough time to be talking about multi-million dollar problems. Remember again as background for this we have three buildings two of which are in bad shape as far as the general physical condition. And they're not in bad shape simply because they have had deferred maintenance. They're in bad shape because they're old buildings. They've outlasted their lifespan. They have the kinds of problems that old buildings uh, acquire. They have roofs that need to be replaced, boilers that need to be replaced, heating and ventilation systems that need to be replaced, upgraded, so forth and so on. And for those of you who are familiar with building problems, uh, both of the elementary complexes have window wall problems, and those were popular in the construction of the 60s and 70s, the kind of school building you see a lot that is now being used, in, uh, particularly at the middle school, but also at Lunt Building. And those, frankly, wear out to the point where you can't just replace a window, you have to replace the whole wall. They are literally walls. And uh, they're, of course, very, very heat uh, inefficient, but more than that, they're leaking very badly. Some of my pictures show teachers in rooms in both complexes, but particularly at the middle school where windows come out. Literally, when you try to open the window, you have to p pick it up and take it out and lay it down on a 
desk or whatever happens to be handy, and when you close it, you pick it up and try to reinsert it. Uh, that is simply a sign of a kind of rotting situation that will not go forever. We have water pouring in in rainstorms through those windows. Many of the roofs have been repaired as far as the surface goes, but there's a lot of structural work that still needs to be done. We have spent the last year analyzing that problem and getting a handle on what the dimensions are in fact. Uh, tonight we have the architect from Portland Design Team, Frank Locker, who was hired this spring with his, with his firm to help us continue the uh, analysis of the condition of the buildings. What makes this whole issue even more difficult is that we have a bulge of population, uh, sometimes called the baby boomlet, <laughs> That is, the children of people who were born in the baby boom generation. And so we have an upswing in population. We have seven years now, beginning with the seventh grade, right down to the current kindergarten, of grades that exceed 100, uh, most of them 130. Some of them are as uh, large as 156, I think, is our largest grade. Um, and beginning at the eighth grade, the high school in the eighth grade run about 100 so that we have a bulge of seven, at least seven years, and we don't know what next year's kindergarten and the kindergartens thereafter will be, we have at least seven years in the system that we can predict very nicely and have charts to show what that looks like of trying to provide space for the next seven years that will, that at least that will accommodate that bulge. And we are literally uh, bending at the seams at both Pond Cove and Middle School. You may be aware that we have portables. And we have, however, the interesting situation of having a half-empty building, or at least three-quarters uh, full, one-quarter empty, building at the high school. Uh, for instance, why can't we uh, go to the state and try to petition for uh, state funds because we're too full at Pond Cove and at uh, the middle school. We can't because we have, uh, if you just take the square footage of the buildings that we have, we have enough square footage to accommodate the number of students we have. They would not be accommodated well because there is a lack of proper program space in those buildings, but at the same time, it means that we cannot simply go to the state and under the current conditions, I don't think that's gonna be too productive anyway. Um, and furthermore, the amount of money we could get from the state in a waiting period is uh, arguably pretty small. We go into that in more detail uh, either later or another evening. So we have two problems. We have two of our three buildings are in bad shape. And I can go into great detail about that if anybody wants you to. We, I cannot say and I will not say that they're in such bad shape that the children and staff that are using those buildings uh, are in life-threatening situations. They are not, but they will become absolutely unacceptable in the fairly predictable near future if we do not do something now. It's that critical. Now, in trying to decide which of the various options to, uh, we have before us in trying to put together a package that looks at all three buildings, looks at our renovation needs, looks at our program needs, looks at the bulge of population needs, and looks at the issue that we have space in the district that we have to use as best we can. I would suggest to the board and to anybody else uh, interested in trying to help make this decision, here are some ways of looking at it. There are other criteria, but these are the ones that we can at least start with. Whatever choice we make from the building options as presented in the space report, summarized for you in uh, in this report, I have copies, a few copies here tonight. We have copies of this in the library, we have copies of this in every uh, school building. We can make more copies of this. There is a much longer report full of sketches of one kind or another and a lot of data. We do not have a lot of copies of that, but we have put two copies of that report at uh, Thomas Memorial Library, also in my office, and certainly can be signed out. These criteria then, maximizes appropriate use of existing space. Uh, for a variety of reasons, we realize that whatever we're talking about is a multi-million dollar problem. The best use we can make of the space we have reduces the potential cost 
obviously. And what do we mean by appropriate use of existing space? Consideration is given to the current use of that space and to projected enrollment needs. Renovations can be made effectively for the long term. Handicap accessibility and other structural issues are brought up to code. I cannot stress that enough. Even our high school is not handicap accessible by current code. And we have, uh, in an effort to deal with that, the district in the last two or three years has spent, um, through a bond, about a million dollars to try to deal with the roofs and handicap accessibility in Pond Cove and Middle School. Only, to, frankly, to have to tell you, we are not up to code. Things are a little better, but they are far from being what they should be. And they cannot be made better by Band-Aid approaches. It is impossible. The buildings will not allow us to do that. Um, part of that code issue, too, by the way, is air exchange. Those buildings are large buildings, and anybody that knows anything at all about large public buildings knows that you have to be careful about your, uh, you know, the heating plant, the air exchange, the way in which fresh air gets into the building and circulated. Uh, we have old ventilators, particularly at the old high school and in the middle school. They're very noisy. They get shut off because people can't teach over the noise. They, uh, so in some cases, we have to cannibalize the uh, old parts in order to get parts to keep them going. Uh, it is a situation that is just limping along and needs attention. That's not even the portables. And the article you saw in the paper about whether the portables were acceptable as far as life code is concerned, they are acceptable. The, number in the paper was just uh, an anomaly that resulted, I don't, really don't know how, but somehow the test was totally wrong. We retested it through a private company. It's acceptable, but it's not ideal. And we are being cautioned to continue monitoring. So it is not something that is absolutely all right. It is the kind of situation that's the kind of thing we can, we can use, but we are told we have to monitor it. A second criteria is that whatever the choice is, it results in well-planned buildings that enhance educational programs. That is extremely important, and that's one of the things that surprised me a little bit about the flyer that I saw that was circulating. There seemed to be the assumption that the school board would make a decision to put children in a building without given, giving proper consideration to the way in which a space would be planned. By no means has the school space committee myself, the school board, the administrators, or any of the other people who have looked at the various options that we have at the very top of our list is trying to come up with the best possible space. And in many cases, it means doing some kind of rehabilitation work. So well-planned buildings, what are some of the items under that? That the grade groupings will work well together. And we have spent hours literally, talking, discussing, arguing um, about what are the grade groupings that might work, what are the ones that really wouldn't work. Uh, we see a number of possibilities, some better than others, all of which I'm sure will have advocates and will have uh, people who don't like them. But that's the kind of situation, frankly, that we are facing. The balance between classroom needs and spe special spaces, that is, when you go into a school building, you need to be aware that there are classroom spaces, but then there are what one would call core spaces. That is, there's a cafeteria, there's a gymnasium. Uh, for upper grades in particular, there would be uh, spaces such as a technology, music, uh, art. All of those are core spaces that are used by a number of students, not just a single classroom. Uh, one of the most difficult situations we face daily is the uh, the cafeteria at the middle school, which is at one end of the building, it is barely handicap accessible, uh, and that only in good weather. And it is uh, a building that, as you know, if you've ever been in it, is a long building, and we have students who have to go to that cafeteria and get back again and get to class on time. It's a terrible traffic pattern. And the third item under that, efficient traffic patterns within areas of the buildings. Again, when you are going to school, or when you are planning a school building, when you are thinking about what's a proper space for children, educationally, for the staff, all of these considerations are important. If you have secondary students or 
uh, upper grade students who do go from teacher to teacher and you have 45 minutes for a class period and it takes them 10 minutes to get from one end of the building to the other and you have five minutes passing time, what happens to your classroom time? This is one of the very obvious reasons why well-planned buildings are essential to well-planned educational programs. There is a, a balance here that we need to be aware of. Number three, facilities, excuse me, facilitates ongoing educational program while renovations are being completed. If we are successful in putting together a package that we can get the support of the town on and actually get moving on the, edu on the renovations, I need to point out that school will be ongoing. These renovations are not simple band-aid renovations. You cannot tear out the heating plant and replace it. You cannot upgrade plumbing. You cannot upgrade uh, various kinds of uh, electrical things in uh, six weeks in the summer. It absolutely cannot be done. So it is very predictable that in planning these things, you have to consider how are you going to hold school and what kind of, of orderly pattern of repairing this building and putting children someplace else and moving children back into the repaired building and so forth, what kind of orderly pattern makes that all feasible without sacrificing the educational opportunities for those children during that particular period of time. And there are some plans that facilitate that, other plans. Um, teachers, of course, can move, because children can move, but uh, it's very important to have those clearly planned out. Um, and the point about how many moves will a group of teachers and students have to make? Will there be appropriate space available during a renovation schedule that would take two or three years to com complete is basically what I'm talking about there. A fourth criteria, criterion, the final package is cost effective. Um, and although tonight we do not have absolute figures, we have sort of guesstimates, there's about $2 million between the least expensive package and the most expensive package. And we're talking, uh, well, we're talking several million dollars, depending on, um, there are a number of issues at this point that are just estimated but we would be talking about a package that would ultimately yield us long-term planned buildings that would be set to go for another generation. Uh, in fact, CAPE really uh, opened the high school a generation ago. It, it is frankly beginning to show a wear and tear rate that makes me worry about the extent of renovation we should be doing to the high school just to make sure it doesn't get in the same condition that Pond Cove and middle school are in now. Uh, but frankly, uh, in, the, in this package, that's a sum that we've got somewhere down on the bottom. But it is, an, it is a real consideration. Uh, what is the least expensive package possible? Are there considerations of long-range advantages that should be balanced against lowest cost? In other words, uh, sometimes the cheapest package is not the best. But again, um, I recognize that that's, that's a tough decision for people to make. There is another criterion that I've heard people talk about. I didn't put it on that list because to me it's, it's actually worked into all of these. And it is a criterion that says, what is good for the child? What is in the child's best interests? And I have to say that of all the various options that uh, I and other people in this uh, group have been studying, I cannot feel that it is in the best interest of children to be going to school in settings where we worry about the air control or where we feel that we have to continue to monitor various kinds of uh, code issues, where we have to shovel off our roofs. And frankly, even though we've repaired the portable roofs, we are now, after finishing uh, our report, there are also parts of the middle school and Pine Cove roofs that we are having to shovel off. There are long-standing cold problems, handicap accessibility being one. Uh, I cannot feel that it is in a child's best interest not to have everybody in this community concerned about the appropriateness of the space in which children are. That's a baseline consideration. I recognize that many people are concerned about how children are grouped, and I suspect uh, that that's one of the issues, for instance, that will be a tough one in this package because going up to maximize the appropriate use of existing space, you, if you look at some of the estimates of cost, every one of the less expensive uh, 
actually every one of the options we're looking at, with one exception, does try to make better use of the high school. The high school was built, supposedly, for 1,000 students. Actually, practically speaking, it can hold about 850. Now, we have 400 students at the high school. But we have to heat the whole high school. We have to pay for the electricity, and I can, I can show you the figures for the entire building. We have to maintain it. We have to, in a variety of ways, keep an entire building going. And uh, if it were not for the uh, really extensive use of community services is now making of the high school, it would be uh, a worse problem than it is. Frankly, I think that having had a high school with the kind of special core spaces that that high school has, that is, it has uh, really wonderful uh, core spaces, the pool, uh, the double gym, good-sized library, uh, technology, music and art spaces, uh, and uh, community services is certainly making excellent use of those kinds of spaces. And it probably would not have been able to grow as much had the building been full. So in some respects, that's a blessing. It has shown Cape Elizabeth what good use of community buildings can actually do. It may not be the first use when people were building that high school. I'm sure 20 years ago, people were not thinking much about community use. But it is a wonderful example of how a community can actually be wrapped into using their buildings. And that is another one of the issues that we're getting at here. I'm going to run through quickly, because I want to get people time, what some of these options are. And again, if this is the first time, if any of you are here totally unaware of the year's work that's gone on to try to pull together some of these problems, I, prob I kind of feel like I'm throwing a lot of detail at you. But uh, I certainly want to make available uh, reports and one way or the other we'll make sure anybody that wants to get a report has a chance. Uh, there, as I said before, there are actually nine options and, and sometimes there are variations on options. I think I really counted 10 or 11 before we were through and we discarded some that never even got written up. Suggested building uses, ways to maximize the use of space we have, provide for orderly renovation, plan for intelligent um, rehabilitation of the buildings, et cetera, et cetera. And these options now, the, the next few slides, are really just focusing on the various grade groupings that would go in different buildings. Uh, So-called option B. Option A isn't included because option A was not recommended for further study. But it is certainly available if anybody wants to look at it. Pond Cove K through 4, that's a five-grade building. Now, to make that a five-grade building, it's necessary to add classrooms. Now, Pond Cove, absolutely, and all the options we're looking at, must have a gym. You may have thought it had a gym, but it doesn't. It has an all-purpose room, which is, by today's code standards, not really acceptable as a gym. Uh, it has, you know, uh, pillars that we have to pad so the kids won't knock themselves silly if they fall into them. Uh, it has a low ceiling, and the lights are, are uh, shielded, but they're still uh, frequently hit by balls, and that is a problem. It's not a gym space. It also, of course, has to be used daily by hundreds of students for lunch. That means it can't be used as a gym during that period. It is the only thing that even looks remotely like an auditorium space for those grades and uh, frequently uh, clashes with the gym program and so forth. But... Um, so all of our schemes do call for adding a gym. That is a one project in all of this that we might be able to get some state funding for because it is an 8,000 square foot special project and there is a process that we will certainly pursue to see if we can get at least up to the uh, level of our debt service some kind of state local funding. One of the problems with this particular set of options is that uh, in order for Pond Cove to house five grades of the size, the count of students that we now have, uh, we're, we get to a uh, situation where we tend to oversaturate the building. More second story classes have to be added and the uh, traffic pattern begins to be uh, a more of a problem. And for that reason, uh, those of us who have studied that do not think that it's a particularly good option, but it certainly is a possible one. 
middle school five through eight. That is taking the middle school as it now exists, simply renovating it and putting five through eight in it. And nine, high school staying nine through 12 with community services at the high school. That's so-called option B. Option B1 is kindergarten in the high school, uh, removing the necessity for some addition at Pond Cove, making it a, um, more like the building that it is now with the addition of a gym and some small addition to accommodate uh, the kinds of special spaces, that is some special ed rooms and so forth, because remember, uh, again, I don't know how much of this you're aware of, but we have a portable at Pond Cove. It is a... Uh, Temporary building has to be replaced. It houses the media center right now and a couple of special rooms, but so that there would be some addition to Pond Cove simply replacing that and, uh, and a small additional use of some special spaces. Again, middle school five through eight. Same building that it is now, but renovated. And high school nine through 12 and community services staying in the high school. Option C. Option C, Pine Cove, again, a four grade building, K through three. Uh, intermediate school, uh, four through six, housed in the current middle school. Uh, now, this particular option is the one that makes the maximum use of the high school space uh, to the degree that we would probably have to add space to the high school. If you look at our current 7th and 8th grade and then look at the projected enrollments for the next seven years, we could, in fact, put both 7th and 8th grade in the high school. But to do so, we would have to add classroom spaces. We would not have to add a gym or a swimming pool or any of the special spaces. But uh, we would have to make major renovations inside in order to have just enough classroom space for the numbers of students we would have. And arguably, as we have looked at it and tried to predict whether that would be sufficient, there is some concern that it might actually require adding a wing, small wing to be sure, but actually adding building rooms to a building that is now half empty, which is, sounds like a real anomaly. But when you're trying to put the numbers in there, you have to go through the process of looking at just exactly what that means. We thought of the 7 through 12 uh, configuration because we thought, well, there is some argument for supporting the idea of putting 7 through 9 as a kind of uh, middle school concept and 10 through 12. Most of the time, people in a 7 through 12 high school setting, they separate out two or three grades in one end of the building. There is an example, for instance, if you're familiar with the building in Falmouth. Uh, they're bridged usually with a shared space uh, in Falmouth. It is the uh, uh, cafeteria. Um, and uh, there's, you know, some shared spaces that way. Unfortunately, our high school was not conceived that way. It was conceived as a high school with lots of special spaces, fairly limited classroom space, because at the time that was planned, there was a lot of interest in open uh, spaces and high school students um, not having study halls. That building was really not sized for study halls. And if you know anything about school scheduling, just think about it a little bit. If you think about high schools, you've got to think about where every kid is every period and you have to keep using each room. And as you empty one room, you get put another group in and some of the groups are bigger than others. And so there are formula you can use. Uh, that Frank Locker, our architect, can explain, if anybody really wants to have it explained, to figure out how many classrooms you need for X number of kids at certain grade levels and presumed programs. Uh, all of that process we have tried to go through in the last few weeks as we have looked for the best options and the best choices for using, uh, going back to the uh, criteria I showed originally, um, and this one certainly has some interesting possibilities but it does seem strange to think about having to add classrooms in order to do it. Again, we would probably only be adding classrooms to accommodate a bulge, because what is very predictable is that we had a bulge of the baby boom, and then we had declining enrollment. In fact, just a few years, Lund School was closed for a couple of years. A school that is now packed, jam-packed, actually was closed and not used. Uh, Cape used to have another kindergarten, uh, K2, I think, building was Cottage Farms. Uh, which is now condos, I think, isn't it? Yeah. 
um, so that uh, it is predictable that just as we're now seeing the children of the baby boom generation, we're going to see the children of the non-baby boom generation. And so uh, adding on to the biggest building in the district raises some questions about whether that's the right thing to do. It may be, but at least it raises some questions. Community services obviously would not fit under those kinds of uh, space needs. Therefore, they would be out and um, there would be, it's possible for them, for instance, to be relocated to some degree uh, with current programs in the um, old high school. Um, and furthermore, Portland design team suggested a modification, Pond Cove becoming only K2, which would reduce uh, the small addition that's in the plan for uh, special spaces and then renovating the current middle school to be a three through six. Um, there are some problems with that, I think, but at the same time, it's a possibility. Option C1. Aren't you glad we dropped some of the options? <laughs> Pond Cove can be K3. The middle school would still be considered a, or could be considered a four through eight uh, administratively with four through seven in the middle school and eighth grade house in the high school. I suppose arguably it could be an eight through 12 high school. Uh, not a configuration that this district has used in the past and one that does have uh, some problems with it, but as far as space use, uh, it is certainly possible. Community services would stay in the high school under that option. The final option that we're talking about tonight is one that came about partly because as we reviewed the options we had, we realized that we had followed a couple of uh, uh, criteria that I didn't have on my sheet. Uh, it is implied under cost effective, but it, it wasn't actually listed. Um, people did start thinking about, well, with, all, with over $3 million needed just to renovate the old middle school, and those of you who are familiar with it know that it is not an educationally um, attractive building. It's a, looks like a, just a series of spaces tacked on each other, and it's an awkward building. It was originally built in pieces uh, for high school, and uh, uh, never planned certainly for middle school age population, and certainly never planned for elementary if we go as low as grade three to put in that building. Um, so that uh, there's a nagging feeling if we're going to be spending millions of dollars, isn't there any possibility of having a decent uh, plan to a middle school? I mean, why spend millions of dollars renovating with, and still have a building that architecturally, as far as uh, traffic pattern and so on, is still awkward and convenient? So we thought, well, let's, let's look at it. And we, uh, as the uh, school space committee, did in fact ask the architect to consider what would be the cost of a new middle school. Just tear down the whole thing and start over again. Uh, and it, that cost is not all that unreasonable, but at the same time, it does exceed, uh, it, it would be the most expensive option. Then we started thinking, well, maybe we can keep part of the middle school, renovate it, but tear down part of it and build an addition to the part that is left. And that's what modified B1 is. Kindergarten in the high school, Pond Cove 1 through 4, middle school 5 through 8, high school 9 through 12, and community services stays at the high school. The change in this proposal centers around the actual building that becomes a middle school. Instead of merely renovating existing space, the architect would use a 1930s high school and the current middle school gym as anchors. Sort of think of a mall here. <laughs> that would become the renovated part of a building that would be built on the current playground and field space boarding on Scott Dyer Road. Those portions of the current building that would not fit into such a plan, most notably the D-Wing, would be demolished. This plan would result in additional cost, but would give a much more cohesive building than would be possible even in extensive renovation work. Uh, so that is modified option B1. Um, that, I think, summarizes the, the uh, package of options. Um, somebody turn the light on. Thank you. There, there are other considerations that are part of all of this. Uh, traffic is something I've hardly mentioned, and traffic is a, uh, is a problem for us. We have a compacted site right now with the uh, 1,200 students almost at the, between Pond Cove and Middle School, and only 400 at the high school. 
um, and we have looked as part of this package, how can we make the traffic more sensible and so on. I think it's important to grasp that this study is really trying to look at the current, what the school buildings that the town of Cape Elizabeth owns to figure out what is a responsible way in which to make them useful for the next generation. All of those buildings have served the town well. All of them. Some of them are really worn out. We can make them habitable buildings. It's going to cost millions of dollars. That's without considering what is the best way to group children in them in order to maximize use of space. As I said, this becomes a two-pronged kind of problem. And the other issue that certainly the board has to wrestle with, how do we make these decisions that involve millions of dollars at a time when it is very difficult to be talking about this kind of situation uh, and in a situation where it's very hard for us to carve out one small piece and take care of one small piece and then two years later take care of another small piece. If we don't have an overall vision of what's going on, we will have a very hard time getting anywhere. Um, I also think, for instance, that one of the peculiarly difficult things here is the fact that there is space available at the high school and that does, in almost all of these schemes, require one grade, and in one scheme, two grades, to be ro relocated at the high school and to try to, to make that something more than just a short-term relocation so that it will justify spending the money that it would take to make that an appropriate space either for the kindergarten or for the seventh and eighth grade or even for that matter the eighth grade. Uh, those are the kinds of choices that the school board is faced with. They're not easy choices. Um, they all carry somewhat, each scheme carries uh, negatives. Some are more expensive and some are simply just harder to um, plan uh, as far as the renovation phase is concerned. But part of our job tonight is to try to understand those options, answer questions, look at what uh, answer as best we can anyway. Uh, and also I want to make the point, this is an ongoing dialogue. The reason why we're looking at the January uh, deadline is to make a decision, at least by that time, whether or not it is appropriate to ask the community for financial backing for any of these things by May referendum. Um, it, just for your information, even if that were to happen, the, that only really triggers a year's worth or almost a year's worth of work, things like the DEP site review, uh, various concept design architectural plans, various kinds of state approval issues, um, so that there is, uh, we're still talking about the actual work being some years down the road. One other factor, however, that I do need to share uh, and to put this into perspective. Next fall, we cannot put our K-8 population in the buildings we have. We have too many children. Somebody has to go to the high school next year. Or we have to rent another portable or two. Um, and those are realities. We have absolutely not enough space we have to find solutions. Uh, and that's obviously what, what we're trying to do here. Um, questions or? Thank you. Uh, Frank has brought a, a uh, sort of a schematic of that last option B1, just to get, since it's the only one that talks about anything that looks different from where the buildings are now, perhaps it'd be appropriate <laughs> just to show that. Um, yes, this is the this is the diagram of the scheme that had actually been developed since we met with you a month ago, and as, as the superintendent has said, it came about in discussion um, with the, the principals and trying to search for what seemed to be um, a, a plan that that uh, responded to more issues. And I'd have to characterize this. Um, this is the B1 modified. I think it it differs from the B1 plan mostly. I think on a qualitative basis. The, the motives that brought it about were searching for a more qualitative solution than the, than the B1 um, proposal was. Uh, let me diagram, or let me point out what the differences are. I'm going to swing back against the way I'm going to Okay. Okay. On this, um, 
on this site plan, the uh, Pond Cove School is here, uh, Scott Dyer Road. The current middle school with the 1930s building, the gymnasium, um, the entry wing, the industrial arts wing, and then the D wing, and the bus garage are in this area. The high school, of course, is over here. So what this plots out is the possibility of removing the sections of the middle school from the back of the gym all the way out to and including the bus garage. Then in lieu of that, constructing new, a new building here for the uh, middle school, which would front on Scott Dyer Road, and then taking the field on which this would be built and rebuilding the field back um, cohesively with the other fields. The um, supplementary portions of the plan then would be to work out a new entryway off Scott Dyer for some parking and service on the side, a bus loop across the front, um, reorganizing the parking between the two buildings and in a lot of ways streamlining it uh, with a defined, a separately defined bus drop-off area at the Pond Cove School and, um, and then reconstructing this entryway as a two-way entry um, exit and then reorganizing the parking between the two buildings. Uh, it appeared as though a good spot for the bus garage would be over towards the location where the town has, has been working on its garage recently. Uh, in this scheme, of course, then the, the wing of the high school, that is the top floor wing, would be uh, converted to kindergarten and um, community services uses. And we've, we've looked at those, and they'll pretty much consume this end of the building from the current lecture hall over to the exit doors. And the scheme, in fact, looks at converting that lecture hall into like a mini recreation room that could be used by the kindergartners and also be used by community services through, through the remaining portions of the day. Other items on here are a drop-off, uh, specifically oriented to kindergarten, and then a gesture towards making the second level of the high school building the actual uh, main entryway for high school students so that functionally, and particularly from an entry point of view, the um, community services and the kindergartens would be as much as possible be, would they would be operating in a separate building from the high school uh, portions of the building. One of the um, things I might point out that this does that um, has been so frustrating for so many of the other schemes, um, the superintendent noted that there were some qualitative improvements in terms of the, the middle school building working more cohesively, and, and a, that's, there's a remarkable difference between the way this might work and the spread out middle school building going all the way to D-Wing. But the other thing that this does is, it, is it, it breaks the congestion on the site plan. Right now, most of the activity is concentrated between these two buildings. And because there's a ball field on the other side of the middle school, we were really restricted from getting out there and trying to make some circulation improvements on that side of the middle school. So what this scheme allows us to do by pulling the middle school up to the road, is it allows us to reconfigure the, the parking, the traffic, the bus drop-off areas. So my sense is that it's made very substantial improvements to easing the congestion around the Pond Cove and actually allowing those two buildings to operate separately instead of uh, as Siamese buildings as they are now. Yeah, uh, what we've looked at is um, essentially keeping the um, entry corridors and the room partitioning pretty much the, the way it is right now, but then taking the rooms and converting them to kindergarten uh, use by uh, putting um, sinks and um, you know um, equipment uh, cubbies and storage areas in each one, then uh, recarpeting and, and painting, et cetera, really uh, redoing the finishes uh, to to in essence, um, bring up to a current standard. So, but I think the key on those is getting the water in them and getting the work. Um, th this as a kindergarten center would, would also be more than just kindergartens. We've talked about uh, converting rooms to storage uh, spaces, uh, resources for art and music, um, having a, like a, a mini library or a satellite library over there. So it's actually a kindergarten center rather than some kindergarten rooms. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
you know, the, uh, we, uh, well, it, the concept would work with probably any of the other schemes. Um, it was directed to this one that in a manner that came out of the discussions that focused on um, certain advantages that the B1 scheme had compared to, to the others. So th that was one we tested to, to develop this one. Yeah. Other questions? Wait, I, I really, I'd like the board to have a chance to ask questions oh, and then when, when it's the public's turn for them to come up to the podium so mm -hmm. that the people on TV can, can hear the questions as well and the answers. Okay. Just one more point on the um, community services and, uh, and kindergarten. Um, again, looking at possible uh, pluses of things, trying to look at this from as positive a point of view as, uh, as we can. One third of our current kindergarten um, actually are enrolled right now in the community services extended day. Um, frankly, they, that one third are spending more time in the high school in extended day than they are spending in the kindergarten class. It seemed to us that it was a logical consideration to think about how uh, school services and community services can work together to uh, make the, that full day, both the school side and the community services side, a coherent and uh, cohesive kind of, of experience. Also to look at those things that, such as converting the lecture hall into an activity space, uh, frankly a better gym space than what, what we now have uh, with has a high ceiling and so on. Those are again ideas. These are not finished ideas, they are part of looking at each option, trying to figure out as best we can what the pluses, minuses would be, but still and all, um, the major underlying need here, the renovation, the long-term solution of some of the other kinds of problems that I've mentioned. Thank you. Okay, um, I'd like this to be the time for the board to ask questions, and I didn't want to go option by option simply because I thought people might like to compare and contrast and, and kind of mix together some things if, if they desire. Um, the administrators are here, Frank is here, uh, Connie, um, so we can ask uh, all of the people who might give us input um, at this point uh, for their ideas. So let's just open it up now. Does anybody on the board have a a question they'd like to start with. I have a question. I'm not sure it's the one I want to start with. Um, are, are we going to tonight, or what is the agenda for this part of uh, the discussion? Are we going to talk amongst each other uh, about which ones we like or don't like, or what input we've had from uh, the community? Uh, there, there are Obviously, a number of different ways to approach it. We could talk among, among uh, ourselves, or we could uh, direct some questions with some of the administrators. Uh, I guess the question that I have in my mind for whoever wants to answer it, uh, if you take the B1 modified plan, which is uh, might cost uh, $2 million or more than the cheapest plan, how much is that difference worth? And how are we going to approach that decision? Obviously, in the short term, which has uh, been our policy, unfortunately, in the past, uh, if you go with the cheapest, that's generally what you, you generally regret it later. Uh, but how are we going to approach the, that uh, two-plus million dollar uh, difference? We're going to do one of these plans. But we have to. What's the extra couple of million dollars worth? Or is that a starting point? So I've thrown around a lot of questions. Do you want to address? Well, um, the fact of the matter is that the current middle school uh, was built in uh, three pieces, still? Three pieces. And it was built within, uh, well, the original was 1930, but the two additions were built within that kind of thing. Obviously, that was a response on the part of the community for a real sudden upswing in 
population. And when he realized that uh, within 10 years, they had to start planning for the whole move to a separate high school, uh, and we're also building one school. You see the rapid nature of how those buildings became what they are. It's no wonder that they kind of came quickly without necessarily having a long-range plan in view. They've never been, uh, the middle school has never been a coherent, well-functioning building with well-defined central <coughs> core space is what one sees in a well-planned school building. The choices, I would say, are find the cheapest way to renovate it so that at least the code situation is taken care of. Those issues that for me have been all the way through this discussion, the bottom line issues. Those <coughs> really are what have motivated me to try to get, you know, still very much motivated me to try to help find the best solution. Over and above that, does the community want a building of which it can be proud? Um, at, at right now, I think that the, the issue is do we have a safe building or at least a cold effective building, um, or do we have a nice cold effective building? Well, we certainly have to get to a cold effective building. Yeah. And we have to accommodate our students. Uh, we certainly seem to be uh, faced with having to spend uh, eight plus million dollars, period. Uh, I suppose if you wanted to start with the question, uh, do you want to be proud of the new building uh, or a new building, uh, you might ask that somewhat differently. Do we want to uh, have a building which will last for another 20 or 50 or possibly 40 years more, or do we want to uh, patch what we have now and make do? That's probably another way of saying that, isn't it? It's really more than being proud of it, it, which is a better investment. At least that's the way I would view it. The other thing is, I mean, since, since I came on the board, um, there's always been talk in the community about, you know, what's educationally sound and educational philosophy and so forth. It seems to me like now's our chance. Um, you know, if we can combine all of this and, com and combine what's educationally sound and come up with buildings that are going to be good for the next generation, this is the opportunity to do that. Well, I, I do want to support that point. Um, hmm. I think we have to really uh, take a look at the functional obsolescence and what the cost is. I've been uh, preaching about the heat going out the windows and all of this. I mean, I think that that's a real issue and I think that uh, there are some cost savings to be had. I think we really have to uh, take a look at the fact that our buildings are community buildings. I am one of those people in town who are in the schools on Saturdays and Sundays as well as Friday nights at 9. And there's always someone in the school using the buildings. And I do hope that this community um, will continue once they know how grave the uh, situation is um, to support um, uh, what is a really um, quality and educationally sound uh, decision, and I have absolutely no thought in my mind that they won't. Um, I am also uh, very interested in educational philosophy. Um, for about three years now, since the uh, uh, fourth and fifth grade went to the intermediate unit, I have been trying every chance I got to promote the fact that uh, most middle school uh, age kids are 10 to 14, which would make our middle school a 5-8 middle school. As a uh, person who pays attention to financial details, I am very excited about the synergistic possibilities of a childhood center, a child center. We currently have uh, three and four-year-olds in our high school. Um, I had asked Sue Weatherby for some numbers, and we have in the after-school uh, daycare program, we have 87 students. We have, uh, in the morning, 52 students uh, in our high school right now. Uh, we have a waiting list for extended daycare. Uh, we have resources available, such as the uh, kitchen and food preparation facilities for snack for children at the high school that they currently use. We have the swimming pool, which can be part of the gym and physical education program. Last year they put up a playground um, and I am very concerned about our lack of handicapped accessibility to all buildings including the high school. Uh, and I do think that uh, we have a lot of options here but I think if from my perspective 
Uh, I'm very uh, excited about this uh, B1 modified. Um, I also had the opportunity at 9 o'clock last night when the wind was blowing to be in the D section just because I was <coughs> investigating without students just how bad the middle school is. It's interesting when you look at it uh, when it's full of students and that's all day and when you look at it at 9 o'clock at night um, we really need to do a lot in looking back over what this uh, our tax rate has paid for uh, long-term uh, educational um, buildings and the facility and the plant itself. Um, we have gotten away very well without paying a whole lot of money for about 20 years. If we compare Cape Elizabeth, um, and we're very proud of how our school does educationally, uh, if we take a look at what we spend uh, for our tax rate compared to other towns our size uh, for capital outlay for schools, uh, we're almost non-existent. So I think we really have to take uh, a long look at educational <coughs> philosophy about community buildings um, and uh, really make, make a hard decision. And I do hope that everybody heard the superintendent that September is when somebody is going to have to be at the high school who isn't currently there. And I don't just mean the incoming ninth grade class. Um, so I do hope that the community will give uh, me input if they see me anywhere, including CVS or the IGA, uh, or call me at home and then uh, let us know because it's a very important decision that's going to affect uh, at least the next 25 years uh, of uh, students in Cape Elizabeth. Thank you, Ms. Other, Anne? Um, <coughs> I think uh, for us to really make a informed decision on this. We're, we're, we really need to hear from the administrators about the pros and cons they see in each of, uh, of these grade level groupings. You know, aside from the amenities of the various buildings, I'd like to, in my own mind, be clear about what the pros and cons are we're talking about because obviously there's no uh, perfect uh, grade level grouping here. Um, I don't know if there's one that's totally unacceptable or not. Um, but I think we need to hear from the administrators so okay. how they and their staff feel. Okay, shall we start with uh, Beth? Would you be comfortable with starting? Um, we met the um, K3 team met on Thursday and talked about um, the space needs and at that time um, I had opportunity to, to really address the, the concerns of the kindergarten uh, team. Some of the things that they're concerned about, and one in particular, is the philosophical, um, their, their current philosophical approach to kindergarten. They see kindergarten as being part of and the beginning of public school education. I think that what they would experience or feel that they would experience at any rate, uh, it, were they to go to the high school, would be a separation. Um, there was a concern about isolation from, from first grade. I think the first grade team representative uh, expressed that, uh, that concern. Um, I think some of the things that, that they did, they talked about in terms of facilities. Um, are the kinds of things that I think that we can look at a little bit more closely. I can see why those kinds of things would be of concern, um, and they're very specific kinds of things that are very important as far as the, as the educational program for the kids. Um, but I think those, those kinds of specifics, we don't have that kind of information at this point. Um, basically, I, I, I think that, the, that, the, that their concern was a philosophical difference they're seeing that uh, currently they view kindergarten as the beginning of an educational program. They feel that this would, would be separate from um, that experience. Are there examples of kindergartens that are physically separated in other schools that anybody has heard of? Our current sophomore class <coughs> was uh, in the kindergarten and I took the opportunity to contact many of their parents and the students themselves about the negatives uh, to their being there. And isolation was not one of them. The, uh, 
the size of the facilities, the lack of the playground, the fact that they had to ride with high schoolers to school um, were the negatives. And other than that, they didn't feel the separateness. And we did not have community services at that time. So we do have in our own school population approximately uh, 80 children, excuse me, high school students, who as <laughs> kindergarten <laughs> students um, were here. Uh, who still live in the community. So, uh, Did they all start school at the same time then? Is that why they were all riding the bus together? I don't know. They, they said that that was their biggest problem was that they were riding mm -hmm. with high school. Yeah, yeah I, just to add to the negative point, <coughs> I did hear also that the, uh, the uh, kindergartners had to share uh, bathroom facilities with high schoolers if somebody had to. Uh, That's what I meant. I was just trying to... Okay. Know, <laughs> but that's a big, Those you know, are the that's facilities a I to a, kinder, to a kindergarten. We're not proposing that. That's right. yeah. Well, no, no. Yeah, I just want to make that clear. That's a, probably a negative that doesn't fly in this case. Right. What about other schools around the country? Well, <clears throat> kindergarten is commonly, frankly, housed in, in a variety of settings. Um, that doesn't, frankly, also uh, obviate the concern about whether it should be the first step in the building process. Uh, from a staff point of view, what kind of opportunities do they have to um, mix with other staff members? Uh, however, I think it really, um, I think it's important to look at this from a creative point of view. If one third of our kindergartners are actually spending time in community services, I think that the message for us is to think of a lot of the ways in which that can become, from a, we really want to look at this from the child's point of view. That is their day. Um, and how, how can we maximize and, and enhance that? Now, um, I, for instance, have been through this recently in Gorm with uh, trying to use buildings and, and know how hard it is and how frustrating it is for staff as well as for parents and, and the kids are old enough, the kids themselves, uh, to face change in patterns of ways of thinking and so on. Uh, we, we had to use a small building, for instance, as a kindergarten center there. It's working, I understand, quite well, although I'm sure there are some ups and downs. That one actually involved uh, busing all kindergartners in Gorm to one building. And the reason we used it was because uh, it was the only um, really space effective way we could utilize that building. It had been a little rural K-8 building. It just happened to be in a part of Gorm that was as central as any other part is, and we were able to work out the, the kindergarten routes. Um, it is, uh, I think, and one other factor here, uh, looking down the road, there is real interest in day-long kindergarten. It's not an issue that, that we have talked about, but it was on posted in, in uh, topics to be talked about on your board goals. Um, if we don't, I mean, for instance, Pond Cove as a site, and again, looking at the, at the physical site, um, as I pointed out in the options, one of the options that we really were pretty lukewarm about was the one that put five grades in Pond Cove, because the only way we could get enough classroom space, given the numbers we have, currently is to continue the second floor and build up and kind of what the term is I think architecturally oversaturate that building. Um, if we go to an all day kindergarten you immediately double the space you need if that's if that were ever a choice. Or is certainly that space available uh, at the high school at the high school and or would there be enough space to accommodate a fifty percent increase in the uh, extended bed? That I can't, I mean, the extended right. day is, is something that uh, an arbitrary limit can be put on. Well, I, 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 I meant the AM or the kindergarten. In other words, people, in fact, sending their, their children to an all day kindergarten. I mean, some already are. Like that. That's, that's correct. Some are really in, you know. Exactly right. One third of our students. So, if that increased, <coughs> what would happen? What would, would the space accommodate that type of increase? Well, if it's the same number of children. Well, I think. Um, I would just like to say, if they went to an all-day kindergarten, we wouldn't need the, those spaces for extended daycare. I was asking the question, just first, if you just had uh, increased clientele of the extended uh, daycare at the kindergarten level, would mm -hmm. we accommodate that in the high school right away? That is in the plan question. for another year. They would give us an additional space in, in the present wing that we have now. We would get one more classroom space. So the children that you are currently serving in your AM and PM care are kindergarten age. They are not preschoolers. Do you have, pre, you, do, do you have preschoolers in your 
program. Oh, yeah. um, the, the preschool uh, kids are in the children's program, which is part of the high school. I mean, I mean they're more of a daycare day situation. Yeah. There are no <coughs> preschool daycare children in the system. Would they move upstairs, incidentally? That program that's down in the basement, in the basement on the first level? The, the preschool, you mean? The preschool. That, that's currently a high school program and has been ever since that building has opened and it's been mm -hmm. considered a part of the high school experience. I would certainly think that would need some consideration. Obviously, it's something to be looked at, but I, I would not see why we would do that at the present I'm just asking out your Right, so exactly. You could have high school students who are part of that program come into the kindergarten oh, yes. area. Yeah. Well, one of the things that, that certainly crossed our minds is that the uh, community services program has, um, and I understand so that that started really in response to the kindergarten or early childhood teachers being concerned about kids having needing some options um, in the community. Um, and I know that this is a national trend to try to think of modifying buildings or if you're building a new building to add rooms to try to bring together the after school daycare with the with the actual school day um, to somehow bring those programs into sync um, or at least into conversation with each other. Um, I think that, that uh, there, there are a number of possibilities. We, we were talking about, for instance, right now we have a problem with our kindergarten busing. We have uh, so many elementary youngsters that putting all our drivers on the road at one time we still have double bus runs for kindergarten and we wind up having some kindergartners, I'm not sure how many, uh, outside or in, in play area for a fairly long period of time. I, I heard some parents concerned Which is a, about yeah. that. And so Sue and I were thinking about, well, if in fact we were to do this, we could probably partially through fee supported uh, um, daycare uh, issues uh, to modify what we were able to do um, or to put the two things together. Maybe we could actually have a totally separate kindergarten run uh, so that we can be more responsive to their actual need. Um, I that just raised that as one of those issues is that's that we certainly don't have all these answers. We're just trying to think about what are the cons? Is there something we can do about it? Are there reasonable? ways of uh, really maximizing what we're already doing. I think also another, some other concerns were um, things like what would happen with art, music, phys ed, uh, special education, how would the kids receive those kinds of services? What about um, a media center? Um, that kind of thing. And those are very, those very much are, are part of the kindergarten day. They have, they have music, are visit once a week at this point. Mm -hmm. Part of that was talked about with the mini media center right in that yes. wing. What about things like art, music, and, and PE and special ed? Would there, I mean, those programs would certainly continue to happen for those children, is that right? They certainly would. The issue, of course, is whether we look at a uh, take, you know, what is the schedule of specialists we have? Do we have specialists in the high school building who uh, would be interested and capable of dealing with um, a kindergarten program? And this is, you know, we have to kind of free up our thinking. We have specialists in all those areas in each of our buildings. Um, specialists that uh, are available to us could be looked at. We could also, of course, <coughs> look at some kind of um, opportunity to hire uh, through community services too, somebody who could be shared. I mean, those, those are just, again, outlines of ideas and suggestions. I would simply want to emphasize that in no way are we talking about, nor would we see it as in any way acceptable to talk about putting kindergartens in some place and not providing them the services they already have. In fact, they might be better. I don't mean to say better qualitatively. <laughs> I just mean they might have, you know, like twice a week, or if that's what people wanted, or, you know, some other kind of thing wouldn't necessarily be a diminished service. What percent of our present kindergarten class require special ed services? Is it, is it started? At kindergarten or there's really there's screening that goes on at that point and and I think people the teachers become aware of, of students that might need services beginning in first grade there are a few that are receiving some services so it's more of a screen what process. percent I don't I don't know what that would be to okay. one of the other concerns about um, option B which is a k4 um, it was 
mainly impacting buildings with too many students. And that was one of the concerns about overloading the high school if you move the seventh and eighth grade there. One of the concerns was if you added another grade back to the to the elementary school, were you starting to overload that building even with adding rooms? And one of the concerns was by the, by the year um, 97, 98, you'd have about 711 students in that K through K through four. And there was concern about the long, the long route one corridor and the number of kids that would be, be traveling that one corridor. So that would be a concern that I would have with about putting another grade into the bond code. I believe that was a concern that was raised by Nancy St. John. So we have to be concerned too about placing <coughs> students and overloading a particular building and the configuration of the building. Or we're going to be in the same boat we're in the middle school now. Another concern um, in just kind of reviewing my mind some of the things that were brought forward uh, was making the transition from, from kid and kindergarten to first grade um, and the lack of opportunity, or at least it was viewed as a lack of opportunity, to make that connection. Um, I don't know if we're finished on <coughs> kindergarten, but I'm, I'm very interested to hear from the administrators on the uh, implications of moving community service to the middle school and also the implications of moving just the eighth grade to the high school. And I can say one more thing about that. I, I would hope, you know, obviously these are all legitimate concerns, but in the interest of moving this process along, uh, are there going to be more meetings among um, yourself and staff members to maybe discuss um, how we could mm -hmm. solve these problems if indeed this was an option? That yes. We really seriously yeah. considering our Right. And I, I, you know, I think that I, both Nancy and I would invite questions uh, and we can you know I think there's an extent to which we can answer those given the information that we have now but uh, certainly in looking at that if that becomes a viable op uh, option certainly in planning that the kindergarten team would be very much involved I think that's a, a good point that that no matter which option it is I don't think anybody's going to hand teachers a fixed plan and say here just move in and here's what you have to do I mean uh, certainly I would think that whoever is affected affected will be very much involved in the implementation of the plan is that right absolutely yeah. Yeah. Uh, I would just hope that um, you know, I've been through this so I, I don't want to sound um, negative but I, I do know that there's a, a period of uh, almost shock when, when staff hears that there's a possibility that this might happen and so on we can go through that period. After that, I think we really get to the open problem solving mode where we start saying, okay, these, these are the realities and these seem to be some of the things and let's see what, what the answer is. I have every confidence in our staff being able to do that as I know you as a board member. Uh, just one quick question. It's a follow-up to uh, the other question. How many of our kindergartners come from Lechmere or Maiden Cove or another uh, nursery or preschool before they arrive at our kindergarten doors. Do you have any data? I don't. Um, I was just wondering how many of our students um, start their process of socialization and education uh, in the kindergarten. I don't know if there are any staff members here who might. Deborah? I would guess that it would be an extremely high percentage. 90? Yeah. It's very rare for the child to come to kindergarten without a key to listen. Thank you. Thank you. Nancy, do you want to speak to 4-5 or, or, okay, Nancy, or was Beth speaking for the? Well, that's, that's fine with me. I'd be happy to answer any questions that would pertain to an intermediate perspective. Whatever your pleasure is. Questions for Nancy? There are a number of different cutoffs. That there's cutoffs after two, after three, after four. And so the, the middle school concept with all its arguments can be applied to different grade ranges. 
Is there any specifically that you find to be more attractive, or there are other, there are other programs or schools that have had better success with one grouping versus another? Well, this is an interesting point of debate. Uh, this is a, a national issue. Um, there's a great deal of research on what effectively um, encompasses true middle school, and Nancy Hutton could certainly address that. Uh, I think that I could best articulate fourth grade teachers' concern that uh, in terms of fourth grade really is not part of a middle school. Fourth grade is and has been, particularly in our community, uh, a swing grade, a grade that has gone back and forth is kind of uh, depending on the population and the student size and the needs uh, of, and of course the direction of the community at that time. Right now we're, we, we've gone from being part of the middle school of 4-8. We're now experiencing uh, being part of a Pond Cove K-5, which faculty has supported to a high degree. Uh, I think that's a, a message that we've heard very clearly from community as well, that this has, has been an umbrella that's worked nicely. The grade level, I think that, and to go back to Rosemary's comments, uh, that works particularly well at a middle school level is a fifth grade. And a fifth grade is a kind of a pivotal grade. It could be part of an elementary uh, under, you know, umbrella under elementary, or it can very nicely slide into the the entrance, the first experience for youngsters as part of a middle school. Um, the ideal, and I think faculty would support this, the ideal is obviously a K-4. That's ideal. An elementary setting of a K-4, a 5-8, and a 9-12. Wrestling with the constraints that we have, uh, looking at um, the building configuration, looking at the numbers of classrooms that we're going to need in the next few years, the proposals that are before us don't embrace that particular grade configuration. So our next step is to look at how we can best utilize and support both what we have currently for physical plant and how we can be house those those grades and how we can best philosophically match what we what we can support I guess um, the current proposal of establishing um, an early childhood center I have to say and having fourth grade move back to the Pond Cove building at first, as, as Connie spoke to, was the staff was, was certainly concerned. And fourth grade staff, uh, Beth and I met with fourth grade staff last week prior to a general full faculty K-5 and <coughs> talked about that uh, possibility. Um, naturally, they were, they were concerned um, because as with any kind of, in the decision-making process, our immediate response is, for what happens within our classroom once we in our particular classroom and as we close those classroom doors we, we have a hard time really seeing the global the K-12 perspective one of the fourth grade teachers ha came back on Monday having had five days to process the information six days actually and came in and said you know the more I think about it and the space study has been on the counter here for a month it's the first time I really looked at it you really we really don't have you know, this seems to be about the best solution, and I think I could definitely support it. Um, I don't know if I'm talking in circles, but that's that's basically how four or five staff look at it. Four, I think, can definitely support. Four's been lots of places. I mean, before you were you were here, um, Mark. Four's been in the Lent Building. Four's been across town. Four's been back in the middle school. Four can be lots of places. In fact, a, a, a K-3 teacher said to me the other day, well, what, what's the problem? Why don't we just take fourth grade and put them down in high school? Well, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, you know it's, it's almost like the, the, the breaking of a new class, making a new classroom. As long as it doesn't hit me, then, okay, let's make another, you know, what else can we do? 
four or five staff, I think, is um, would be supportive of of the B one proposal. See, Plan B does address your concern about a K-4, and it puts the fifth back into a 5 eight middle school right. and keeps the high school at a 9-12. Right. What it doesn't address is the still greatly underutilized space or 25% right. underutilized space at the high school. My concern was the amount of impact that it's going to have on the Pond Code by adding another grade, and essentially by six years, adding about 200 more kids to that building. To the 700 and, and uh, in plan B. 711? Yeah. In 94? Because right now, K, K4 has essentially 532 students. And by the year um, um, 80, 97, 98, you would have essentially 711, 711 students if our growth continues the way mm -hmm. that's, mm -hmm. that's going in the last few years. But I that's don't have. My concern, too. My concern it's not so much the underutilized space right now at the high school. Right. It's how the K-4, right. even with the additional classroom and, and a new gymnasium, you still have that long corridor. Uh, we still have the long corridor. And my, other, my one other concern that I have is, quite frankly, the utilization and the filling up of, we're talking about filling in some of that playground area out back. Um, we don't have a lot of space out there as it is for youngsters. Uh, we're going to have to make some concessions about, w in terms of where, where kids are, social, where kids socialize, really, as well. Um, the other concern I have, uh, and one reason I would have trouble supporting um, fourth grade as part of a, a, a middle school, is that when we got to the point where we said the curricula is going to fit the needs of the child as opposed right. to the child having to fit into the curricula. We said we will take children where they are and mm -hmm. and go from there mm -hmm. with the hopes that children would then enter school um, as uh, five-year-olds in kindergarten. So we actually are looking at uh, fourth graders as nine-year-olds. Um, do you see that trend happening? Is, is, it, are we moving towards younger ages Definitely. in, in mm -hmm. each grade? And it would yes. be very hard, as far as I'm concerned, to call a nine-year-old part of a middle school. Concept. There's no research that I know of, and Nancy Hudson can certainly address it, that supports a, a fourth grade as part of a middle school. I, I really, I know of no research that would advocate nine-year-olds being part of that environment. Um, we've done it in terms because of space needs. We have not really considered ourselves part of the middle school. We've been housed in the middle school before, but um, it's quite frankly not desirable. Other questions for Nancy? Okay. Nancy, hi. <laughs> I, I would also say I don't know of any research that says a fourth grade should belong in a middle school. I do know of at least one other middle school that has a fourth grade in it, and um, very much because of space needs. Um, they have a K-3 building that holds all of their K-3 students, and the 4-8 building holds their 4-8 students. And a, once again, a decision made more on space and the availability of space rather than a piece of wonderful research that had been done on housing nine to 14 year olds together. Okay. Um, I'd be glad to respond to a specific question that you had. I, I would tell you that we have known all along that next September we're out of space for the middle school. Um, we don't have enough room for the approximately 430 students that we have coming our way. Right now we currently have 370. So our faculty has been looking at what are we going to do for a long time. And the eighth grade particularly has looked at if somebody moves, it's very likely going to be us. So when they look at possibilities of what about the eighth grade at the high school, the eighth grade team has been looking at that. In fact, we were getting ready to begin to look at that very seriously uh, for what we would need to do. 
Mike Madden, who is our science teacher in the eighth grade, has also been collecting and hoarding boxes since September uh, because he looked around his room and he does have a, a nice big room with lots of drawers and storage space in it and he's been concerned about how he was going to get everything down to the high school because Mike also is very good about he doesn't keep extra things that he's not using. So uh, we've been kidding him about his box tower for a long time. He hasn't gotten rid of those boxes yet, so he's still ready to go. I think um, if a question came up about what, what concerns do you have about an eighth grade at the high school, when you look at early adolescence, you look at great changes emotionally, physically, socially, and intellectually. I think as far as academics are concerned, um, it could be a very positive move to the high school. One thing people like Mike Madden wouldn't mind running down the high, to the high school for is the access to the science labs. Um, we have inadequate to no science labs in the middle school. Uh, we have one, it's in Mike's room, it's the old high school science lab, um, and it has not been renovated for a great number of years. Uh, two of our, well, in fact, all three of our seventh grade science classrooms do not even have water access. So uh, for eighth grade students to know that they could go to a high school where they would have access to science laboratories is a real plus for them. And I think for the academic programming, there could be several different pluses. The area where I would be concerned, and I think that our faculty would be concerned, would be in the other two areas, emotional development, social um, changes and development, physical adjustment and changes. And I think that those are the ones that we can see that would be of greater concern to us um, than the academics. And that's where we get into some kind of a balancing act about is one more important than the other. And certainly not, we do feel very strongly that we want to offer um, high quality academic programs and it would be nice to have a really good facility to do that in. Um, also though, and I was just watching in the hall yesterday and um, just watching some of the eighth grade students and how they are coming to be more aware socially of who they are, um, socially of one another in a different kind of way than when they had been friends before. And in the beginning of those, they are rather awkward. Um, it is acceptable in a middle school to do that. It is acceptable um, by the adults that are around you. It is acceptable by your peers. In fact, they don't know that it's necessarily awkward. Everyone's sort of trying out some of the same things. <laughs> for adults who watch them um, and work with them, we also don't think of it necessarily as awkward. But from someone, they took a plain view of us, they might see, think, what is, what are those people doing? Um, that I get concerned about because they wouldn't be allowed to, to be those, um, those kinds of people in a high school as easily because instantly you would they might try to be too sophisticated. Um, when we've talked with them before about this issue, because the eighth grade going to the high school is an issue that's come before this community before. And at the time I was teaching and in talking with a group of students, some of their concerns were, you know, if I go to the high school, I think I might have to make some decisions that I'm not really ready to make yet. And I think the dilemma for them is that they know what the right decision is, what they still think is the right decision, but also being accepted into your peer group is so critically important to them that they might negate that thought and just go with something else. A lot of the young people I deal with, um, when we talk about some misjudgments they have made in behavior, um, they will look at me after we talk for a while and they say, well, you, you know, Ms. Hutton, I really don't know why I did that. You know, I, I know that's not right. I don't know why I did that, but I just did it. And I think that's something that happens when you're 13. And I, those are the kinds of issues I would be concerned about with kids at the high school, those emotional, physical, and social things. Academically, I think, I can't stand here and tell you that academically, with the facilities we'd have access to, that we'd be in a, a worse situation than we are now. I don't think we would. We could improve some of our science program and do some of the things that we want to do. We would have access in some of our cross grade level math classes would be easier for us to adjust to because students who need Algebra 2, for instance, could go to an Algebra 2 class in the high school. So there are some things that would work very much in our favor. Mark. Charlie. Oh. <laughs> I just want to point out, I can see the advantages Seventh and eighth grade will have more public facilities for biology and 
Yes, and I, I would say as a faculty, they're, they're very excited about the modified option B1. Um, to be a, a middle school that's five through eight and to have a facility that would be designed for them. It is not, it may be becoming more common now to find a place where a sp school was built specifically for middle schools. That's a relatively new thing. Most middle schools do exist in places that were once high schools because the high school got a new building and the middle school inherited the old one. That is a very common situation, the one we find ourselves in. Um, so it's a, a newer situation, and I think in the last probably five years or so, there have been more completed constructions that were designed for middle-level education, and so have that in mind. Um, and there are lots of exciting things we look forward to doing with that, and that give us an option to stay together. One of the things that we came over, um, the team leadership from the middle school came over and looked at all of the plans that used to be up on the wall in the conference room. And as people who exist in an oversaturated building, um, our concern also for the, the B plan that had the um, option B that had the K through four building is that you don't have to go real far to, to find out what is it like to live in an oversaturated building. You know, you can interview anyone in the present four through eight building, you know, adult or student, and they can tell you that what that is. And right off, even though we liked the five through eight middle school part, we could see that it took a lot of their playground and also that they just were swapping we were swapping our present condition for their con the condition that would be theirs. Uh, the same situation uh, that we are concerned about is if seventh and eighth grade go to the high school, because Frank and I toured the high school together and then we sat down and did some things with some numbers. And uh, we're very concerned that within two years, we're out of space at the high school. And so our question would be, are we in a situation where we're just swapping one over saturated building and experience for another one? Um, and that would be our concern with um, the seventh and eighth grade at the high school is, is once again having a building that's oversaturated. Yeah. Just a follow-up question on that concept to administration and uh, one, one of the questions was, uh, what is the amount of change that can occur with each different system and how adaptable each one is? Um, and for the, the <coughs> concepts that have seven through nine at the high school, uh, that's my question is very clearly, if, even if we were done in five years in 96, we have over 800 students on that site and the building designed for 800 so there would be no room for, group, for growth. And how, how would that long, how would long range plan be addressed in that particular configuration, 7 to 9 and 9 to 12, or 7 to 9 and 10 to 12 actually? So by so additional building. Yeah, add on. Well, or move <laughs> yeah, that, that question of where the flexibility in the system is is, is, is one that really needs to be wrestled with. Um, if the seven and eight moved to the high school and then there was a population swell, you, you only have two choices. One is to reconsider having the seventh grade in high school, perhaps moving them back to the middle school if it was a title of or if it looked like it was going to be a constant increase, then you could put a condition on that. But if you're moving seven back to the high, back to the middle school, then your design for the middle school would have to be beforehand. You'd have to design that for much the seventh grade would be kind of designed in multi space. You know, you, you couldn't design this, the different sites exactly for what you're looking for long range, long range plan. Seven, eight, nine concepts and these short lived concepts, and, and that seven would drop up quickly. So you'd have to take new considerations in the middle school in terms of design. Yes, yeah, shift the seventh grade back to the middle school in the ordinary Because the, the seventh grade at the middle school required some programming additions that, if you took them to the high school, would be eliminated. One. Excuse me, one of the issues that I didn't put up on my criteria list that I thought about though, um, if you move seventh or eighth grade, if you move the sim uh, let's just say move the single eighth grade, staffing, and think again of how an eighth grader spends his day. An eighth grader sees a number of student uh, teachers in the course of the day. The implications for staffing, we have staff, of course, that teach both six, seven, and eight. Mm -hmm. We have some that teach just seven and eight. Uh, we utilize occasionally a high school teacher who, who bridges that 
Um, and uh, it's a very delicate uh, balancing act, and we often uh, find ourselves constrained uh, with that schedule. Um, putting the eighth grade uh, into the high school is going to greatly complicate that issue. Uh, one of the, uh, again, one of the advantages of putting kindergarten there is kindergartners have one teacher, plus, of course, shared specials. But it would be far easier for us to deal with providing appropriate specials for kindergarten than it would be for us to rethink all the staffing of moving a single grade to the high school. We have not yet actually sat down and thought that through, but I certainly uh, made some quick thinking of what <laughs> staff assignments are currently, um, and uh, it gets pretty complicated. So the yep. more different courses, the more different levels of courses, the more different choices we're trying to give a variety of ways, the eighth graders, uh, and then inserting eighth grade in high school, you have certification issues, you have credit issues, you've got a whole bunch of issues that pop up, that don't pop up with anybody. I would say too that one of the areas, a couple of areas that comes up as well as in our mathematics program, which we've really started this year, some cross grade level groups. And um, if the eighth grade wasn't housed with the other middle school students, then accessing like a plain geometry class, uh, which we have a plain geometry class in the middle school this year made up of both seventh and eighth graders, um, becomes more difficult to do. And so, and that pro our math program, we're experiencing some success with that. So it's a thing that we would like to continue to work on because we feel like we're improving the instruction with those offerings. And that is a consideration that we would have to work through. Another person who has spoken up and said, what would this mean for my program is Tony Boffa and the band because you would be separating the seventh and the eighth grade and the opportunity for them to practice together as a band unit would be um, difficult, um, not impossible. One thing about middle school people, we never think anything's impossible, and I think it has a lot to do with the grade levels, with the age levels we work with, but um, it's not impossible, but it is a concern. It would be a concern to work through. Um, just for the people at home and in the audience to clarify what was just said here, um, what would happen in terms of specials if the kindergarten were to move to the high school? We would have to worry about art, music, and physical education in terms of staff moving. If we were to do that with the eighth grade, we would have to deal with art, music, phys ed, special services, which amounts to approximately 15% of the middle school uh, staff uh, population, industrial technology, computer, band, chorus, foreign language, life skills, and health. Just to sort of put it in perspective. When you said you were kind of assessing your current eighth grade class. I would caution you of using that eighth grade class as a standard because they are unique. They are. Oh, oh they are unique. The, the things that I was watching them with, though, aren't, aren't necessarily some of their true uniqueness. Are the, the eighth grade class is now a ninth grade class. It was a class that missed a lot of, a lot of opportunities or had few opportunities mm -hmm. thrust upon them. But this current eighth grade class is, is our transitional class that mm -hmm. has a wide range of ages. Mm -hmm. And again, majority, I would be looking more, would the seventh grade class, I know a lot happens over summer, but would they be able to handle it? Back. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that there's That's lots of things to consider. Um, kind of thing. I think when I was speaking about some of the emotional and physical and social things, so those weren't just oh, based on this year's observations, but um, just observations over 10 years in middle level education. Uh, and I only things. say that as, a, as an eighth grade parent. <laughs> well, the, the three seventh grade parents. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think any of us want to touch that one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Frank. We are sort of in the unique position of having um, a larger house and being informed that somebody is going to move in. We don't know who. <laughs> um, we understand that. And I think that the high school faculty um, has been very realistic in understanding that there is um, uh, a certainty that s some more students will join us in one way or another, at least next year, if not in the for the long term. We've, we've looked at all of the options, and I think um, a, a number of, of concerns have emerged. Um, 
I think starting with the grade grouping, I think that for, I, I think I speak for, for all high school faculty in saying that we really believe that, that the high school ought to be 9 through 12. It ought not to be 10 through 12. I'll get to that, to the double option for a minute. But I think that we find that, um, that for ninth graders, I think we, we believe that it ought to be 9 through 12, that they work better being, if you will, the youngest grade and trying to stretch up and behave in a more mature fashion. I think they are one year beyond the, the developmental process that Nancy described, and I think she's very right that eighth graders um, need a certain amount of privacy in their own space to experiment in, in that stage of, of adolescence. I think by ninth grade, most ninth graders like being in high school. Um, there's an academic fit of the ninth grade in the high school program. Um, we have ninth graders in uh, uh, multi-aged classrooms in language, in mathematics, um, and um, in science, and in music, art, um, industrial technology. Um, by and large, they fit very nicely. Um, they fit, I think, nice, most nicely with 10th graders and some 11th graders. I think they're very much intimidated by 12th graders, but I think that they fit well with all students. <clears throat> I think that we um, are, are, are concerned about the option that would have a, a 7 through 9 middle school and a 10 through 12 high school not just because of the grade groupings. Um, Nancy addressed the issue of, of an over uh, tax space. Um, by 1996, the fall of 96, the high school will be somewhere between 550 and 600 students. That is one third again as large as it is now. And that is grades nine through 12. Um, if we were to have two more grades that would average about 140 students, we would end up with something on the order of, of 800 to 840 students in that building in two very different educational programs. And as we have sort of mapped it out roughly, um, the high school would be largely confined to the upper floor. And quite candidly, we would not have enough classrooms to run our program. And that leads me to, to a, a sort of a phenomena that I think is not carefully addressed by people who sort of look at the high school and see a huge building and say, gosh, they got a ton of space. Well, we do in some respects, and we don't in others. A great portion of the high school is in, is in specialized spaces. Um, virtually the entire lower floor of the high school is specialized space. That is the gym, the pool, the cafeteria, the locker rooms, the auditorium, the industrial technology wing. That's probably 50% of our building. And it is not readily convertible to, to your general classroom space. So when you look at the thing, you say, what a huge barn. You've got to understand that it's very specialized space. It is space that a lot of high schools don't have. That is, there are many high schools that operate very successfully their classroom program without an auditorium, not without a gym, but certainly without a pool. And so when you start thinking about how big the building is, keep in mind that some of that bigness is public space. And there's also a huge lobby foyer in that building. So that there's a lot of space that we can't use for education in a conventional sense. When you get down to what we're giving up in any of the options you talk about, we're talking about really giving up general classroom space. That is space that is not dedicated to science, art, industrial technology or something. And we will be giving up more space, if you will, with a kindergarten uh, early childhood center, or kindergarten center, than we would probably with the eighth grade by one or two general classrooms. Nonetheless, we're talking about relinquishing uh, roughly eight to 10 general classrooms, leaving us with somewhere around 14 general classrooms. Now, I, I emphasize the word general because I'm talking about teaching math, English, social studies, foreign language, and health in those classrooms. Science is space rich. We have wonderful science labs. And we have extra science labs. We have a science lab this year we're not using at all. And community services is using it um, for, for sewing and, and uh, needlework and, and so on and so forth. And we've just sort of permanently not using that this year. That will not be the case 
if somebody else moves into our building, you can be sure. But what I'm saying is you have to understand that not all space is the same when you look at the high school and say, well, they have a ton of space. So that when you add roughly 150 to perhaps, we don't know, it's certainly, a, I think, 150, just looking at the classes that are currently in the system, four or five years from now, 150 more students, that will tax the general classroom space that we're talking about relinquishing. All that notwithstanding, I think we can offer an excellent high school program and relinquish roughly eight, eight to ten classrooms. Um, if, if we have a, a seventh, eighth, and ninth grade program and a tenth, eleventh, and twelfth grade program, we're going to be spending somewhere in the neighborhood of a half million to a million dollars to renovate the high school just to hold that, that population, even before 1996. So we, I think, are strongly in favor of receiving one grade level and not two. And I think we, we feel that we can offer a good educational program. One of the things that's kind of different about high school is something happens with students productively when they are not in class if you have space. That is, you can have conferences with teachers, students can go to open labs, um, they can work uh, um, in small groups, but they cannot do that if the building is so saturated that there are absolutely no places for students or teachers to meet with each other because there are classes going on in the classrooms. And, and this is when people are not, are not scheduled. So that if we have a seven through nine, and a, and a 10 through 12 program, there will be no space for students who are not in class except in the cafeteria or the library. And there will be no space for teachers to meet with students. And when I say that, I mean, I've, I've sat down with the, the building blueprints and with a projected I increase in the classrooms that we're going to put in to make that, I think that's option C, uh, work. And it, it simply doesn't. So I think that for a lot of reasons, uh, uh, the high school faculty is not in favor of that, and I think Nancy has addressed that as well. Either of the other two programs, I think we would find, uh, find it easy to work with. And I think that um, Nancy has alluded to many of the problems that, that the eighth grade might have in the high school. I think academically it would be a, a wonderful fit in, in many ways. I think socially it has more problems. Um, I think more problems from the eighth grade's point of view than from the high school program, but, but there has more problems. Uh, in terms of the high school program itself, w w there are many benefits, I think, to having the kindergarten there. Uh, for one, a number of high school students now assist in the elementary school. Um, I think more would like to do that, and I don't know how many might be used uh, profitably by um, early childhood programs, but I think that, that um, we would see that as an exciting option um, for our students. Um, I think that, that those, are, those are our major concerns. Uh, six grades in the building is, is tough. Um, the, the concern is about the general classroom space. When that, that, that's what's really going to be whittled away, not the specialized spaces. So that you're really talking about taking away some space that would seem to be excessive, but really is not. Uh, even at the moment, it's not excessive. What are the number of students that now take the early childhood course? Does, um, I has think they're about. Or is that uh, constant? Does that has that declined? Is it? No, it, that has not declined. I, I think there are about 20 students that help with the preschool program downstairs, but there are there are about 12 students that now are working um, uh, in in the uh, elementary school um, classrooms in, in one way or another. Um, and I don't know whether you're including those or not. That's, I think there's probably about in excess of 30 kids who, in one way or another, work with younger children. Are you aware of any other 8 to 12 configuration? Um, yeah, I've heard of a few. It's not, it's not common. I think um, it, we've, we've talked about the... Uh, there's considerable interest in within the high school faculty of, of <coughs> developing an, uh, a ninth grade team. Uh, there are a number of teachers who would do that. I, I think they see that as a transition from uh, middle school to high school. I think that there's, there's a, a feeling that 
um, when ninth graders um, come to the high school they they are in fact just as Nancy talked about the fourth graders being sort of a, a pivot pivot grade the ninth grade is too um, and I think that if the eighth grade were to come to the high school I, I think there would be even more of an impetus to develop a team approach for the ninth grade and lend some support for um, uh, I think the eighth grade team that would be there and that may happen for other reasons um, some curricular reasons that people are, are exploring but I don't know of many 8 through 12 schools I know of, of quite a number of 7 through 12 schools and in those schools they try to develop a certain amount of privacy between the 7th and 8th programs and the 9th through 12 programs that usually coexist we would be able to do that we've looked at putting the 8th grade both with Nancy and, and amongst ourselves in, in a section of the high school that would minimize the interaction between high school students and eighth graders and allow the eighth grade program access to the specialized spaces they need um, so we we've, we've tried to think that out but I'm not sure it's a common grade division Frank uh, did I understand you correctly that uh, two or three years out we might have to spend more money and uh, if I did, then the question is, uh, to Frank Locker, is uh, do the numbers that we have been presented uh, allow for that, uh, for spending more money in the high school than having to, to add a wing to that? I, I don't know about the wing, but certainly some of the renovations were in some of the options that were presented by the Building Study Committee. But, but does that include that spending? Does it include building a wing? No. Does it include accommodating the because uh, that, that's a very vital number because the C uh, options are the cheapest but if all you're doing is buying an expenditure two or three years out of another million and a half dollars then all of these options have roughly the same cost well, that's a possibility is that if the C options created more space in the high school by by completing more finished space behind the library and underneath the um, there's another section I'm going to point to. Uh, there's a section over here which has got mechanical equipment in it and it, it's a storage room right now. So essentially we were, we were taking storage rooms and converting them to administrative spaces in the classrooms. Um, but the key issue is that they are all targeted for the 1997-98 populations, which is as far as we can see. We really don't know what's happening beyond that. If, if the population in the town should continue to rise, um, then we will we wouldn't have with the C schemes a building which is saturated and we have to add on to it. We went beyond. If, if we went beyond 97, 98, 97, 98 it's it's just too far to plan it. Okay, hand. so basically that spending in the high school was already in the in the same figure. They're spending for those conversions, right? Okay, but no additional space beyond that. Isn't it also true that in, in that option there is excess space in the middle school building? I mean, you've already renovated, yes. and that's just four through six and community services, but um, there was still space, right. I believe, right? While we've always focused, well, discussions have been focused on available space in the high school as it stands now, other schemes created available space in the middle school. Yes, I understand it too. With the 7 through 12, were you not looking at the maximum class sizes that the state allows as far as um, numbers of children in the classes? Uh, when we did the first pass on it, we were using, I believe, 25. Um, and then when we went back and did a more thorough look at it, I believe we adjusted it down a little bit. Yeah, you, you dropped it to 22. But, th but that and that's currently larger than it's is typical is typical now or, or even in the past few years uh, where our typical class sizes are there are some classes that are in the in the low 20s or mid 20s and there are many classes and more classes that are under 20 so that most I think most of your high school classes are under 20 
sizes. Um, the high, the high schools that offer more choices for their students inherently have to have a facility that gives more flexibility. Um, and as a, and the school gets more and more students in it beyond the design capacity, what really happens is that choices for programming get reduced. Uh, you have to you have to find ways to always have 25 students in the class instead of being able to offer class, you know, a course with only 15 students in it. You have to guide students to taking industrial technology, even though they may not want to, because there's no other spaces available in the building. So what really happens as a high school gets overcrowded is scheduling becomes um, uh, impossible, and the net result is that you reduce your program options and the quality of education goes down. Um, in the first pass, the tests that we did, we were using state standards, which essentially um, have, I, I would say, less choice in them and a higher utilization of spaces. And we made the second pass, we tried to account more for what was really happening in the case of Cape um, And you know, that, in fact, may not have gone far enough to test it all the way through the scheduling and everything else that needs to be done to know that we're doing So I think there's really an inverse relationship here. The tighter your buildings are, the poorer your educational offerings are going to be able to We need to avoid making the buildings so tight that there's no room to move. One of the concerns that the, 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 the faculty has raised is that the typical high school student takes more than six courses in a, in a given semester and throughout the year. Um, and I think as, as Mr. Locker has pointed out, if, if we get cramped for space, one of the easy ways to solve th that problem is say, fine, now you can only take five courses. So that the, the extra things that people like to do, they don't get to do just because we need the space. We, need to, we have to schedule what I would call your basic core courses in a high school of, of you know, English, English, math, social studies, science, and a foreign language for most of our students. Um, industrial arts, art, music, um, the fine arts, will, I think, will have excellent space. Um, but in terms of making it easy to schedule all those, it may become more and more difficult because, in fact, with the seven, seventh and eighth grade, they will also be sharing those common spaces. So that we're really, um, as I say, you, you one of the ironies of the current physical plant is no matter how you slice it, um, if, if, if you are going to end up with extra space somewhere, except for <coughs> the proposal where I think they're really designing a middle school for a middle school program rather than making the middle school program fit the space that exists. And that, that's kind of a, I think an important plus of that option. Other questions for Craig? Yeah. Um, Thank you. 